before. I actually tried to do this kind of research uh, back in April because I suspected there would be serious overlap between some of the target sequences they're looking for with the PCR test and our human uh, genome because of this confusion about exosomes and what RNA comes from what source and all of this. I looked at a different protocol than the one published here. I looked at one from Germany, and this one is from the Pasteur Institute in France. But it really confirmed my suspicion, and I was glad to see it, that basically one of the primer sequences in the PCR test, according to the, the uh, Pasteur Institute protocol, is an exact match for a sequence in our own human DNA on chromosome 8. So I thought it might be helpful um, to take this and because it's, it's a big thing, it, it means a lot, but I want, you, you know, it's difficult to kind of understand what are the real uh, implications of a finding like this. So I thought it would be really helpful if we could just understand PCR a little bit better first and just the basics of how it works. So bear with me here, I wanna share my screen. Using reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction, RT-PCR, in COVID-19 testing. COVID-19 testing usually begins with a swab of the nose or throat. Saliva, mucus, or fluid from a patient's lungs can also be used. The swab of a person with COVID-19 will contain a mixture of human cells, virus particles, and other microbes. Like all living things, the human cell has DNA as the genetic material that passes on information from one generation to the next. The DNA molecule is made up of two strands that look like a twisted ladder or double helix. However, the COVID-19 virus, SARS-CoV-2, and many other viruses, including HIV, have RNA as their genetic material, genome. RNA is chemically very similar to DNA, but has only a single strand. The virus RNA is surrounded by a nucleocapsid protein within the virus envelope. Other proteins are embedded in the envelope itself. The SARS-CoV-2 genome contains genes, blue arrows, that carry the directions for making these and other proteins that are needed to replicate the virus inside the human cell. The objective of COVID-19 testing is to identify part of the viral genome in the patient sample. This is usually the end gene which carries directions for making the nucleocapsid protein. There is not enough viral RNA to detect directly in the patient sample, so a process called reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction, RT-PCR, amplifies many copies of a segment of the N gene. Short, single-stranded pieces of DNA, called primers, recognize unique RNA sequences within the viral genome that bracket the target region of the N gene. After the first primer binds, an enzyme called reverse transcriptase extends, synthesizes, a single-stranded DNA copy of the viral RNA, known as complementary DNA, or cDNA. After the RNA is removed, the second primer binds to the other side of the single-stranded cDNA. Then, a second enzyme, TAC-DNA polymerase, extends a second strand to produce the double-stranded DNA copy of the target region of the viral RNA. This DNA copy then undergoes successive rounds, cycles, of amplification during which the DNA separates, denatures into single strands, both primers bind, anneal, to their target sequences, TAC polymerase extends, synthesizes a new DNA strand, and so on. The number of copies of the target region of the viral genome doubles with each cycle. After 30 cycles, up to a billion DNA copies of the viral RNA are produced by PCR. In practice, the virus is typically detected with 30 to 45 cycles of PCR. Adding a fluorescent probe allows the amount of target DNA to be detected in real time and quantified after each cycle of PCR. This graph shows the detection of 200, 20, and only two virus RNA molecules in a controlled study. Results from swabs vary. A negative result is also shown. See these DNA Learning Center animations for a more detailed look at the PCR process.
So I'm going to play two different parts here. In the first part, they're talking about where they get the sample from. So listen to this. The swab of a person with COVID-19 will contain a mixture of human cells, virus particles, and other microbes. So did you hear that? It will contain a mixture of human cells, virus particles, and other microbes, which could mean bacteria or fungi um, or other microbes. Okay, so it's not a clean sample. And if we were testing for human DNA or RNA, we could find it because there are human cells in there and also fragments of human cells, such as um, apoptotic bodies or exosomes, or sometimes there's even free human DNA circulating in some of our fluids. So this is not a pure sample, and it certainly contains human genetic material from the beginning. So if we test for it, we could find it. Now this is uh, the, another segment of here, and this shows sort of the mechanics of how the test works so you can get an idea. There's not enough viral RNA to detect directly in the patient's sample. So a process called reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction, RT-PCR, amplifies many copies of a segment of the N gene. So what they're saying is that there's a tiny, tiny amount of the RNA that we're looking for in this sample that's really messy and contains a lot of stuff. So in order to be able to detect it at such tiny, tiny amounts, they have to amplify it or make multiple copies. And that's really what the PCR test does. Short, single-stranded pieces of DNA called primers recognize unique RNA sequences within the viral genome that bracket the target region of the N gene. After the first primer binds, an enzyme called reverse transcriptase extends, synthesizes, a single-stranded DNA copy of the viral RNA. Okay, so I want to uh, stop here because this really shows the important part that we need uh, to pay attention to. That you see in the bottom right hand, there's this short primer, right? So that's the only thing that we have identified in advance, like we created the primer. We could make a primer for any sequence, for any organism. And then when we put that in this reaction, Basically, we're looking for a piece of genetic material from some organism that matches it, is the complement, okay? Because when these two strands go together, they have a complementarity. It's like a plus and a minus that attract each other. And it's Gs and Cs and As and Ts, okay? So, so this is going to look for a specific sequence in the sample that we're trying to find. And what the long strand that you saw in this video is, that's the sequence that could be from another organism that we're identifying. Now, since the primer, at least one of the primers that we have uh, been talking about is an exact match for a sequence in chromosome eight, then it could identify a piece of a transcript from chromosome eight, rather than some genetic material from another organism. In other words, it, it can detect our own uh, DNA. So I'll just um, wanna share one more thing here to verify to everyone, uh, because it's, it's really important to make sure that this um, information is correct. And so this is right here, the sequence of interest, okay, this 18, letter uh, code, and it says it's from the RDRP gene in the virus, okay? Now, I don't know if I can show both of these on the screen at the same time, but I'm gonna try my best. So this I'm scrolling through right now is from GenBank, which is uh, part of the National Institutes of Health where they store all of the uh, sequences from the Human Genome Project and also from other animal genomes. And so you can see Homo sapiens is human, chromosome eight, and then all this gobbledygook here is just basically how they um, took the cell, the, all the DNA and split it up for sequencing, and this is the primary assembly when they did it this way. But if you um, look to the bottom of this, and it gives some references, here's the actual sequence and that matches exactly this sequence here, which is from, sorry, you're in the way. The, um, where does it say? The, 
the Pasteur Institute, sorry, it's uh, listed on the top in the file name, but this is the Pasteur Institute protocol from the World Health Organization. So you could see those sequence, sequences uh, match up perfectly because there's more than one primer that they can use. So, so th this whole testing thing is very, very heterogeneous around the world. So in other words, there are different protocols in virtually every country. And a lot of them are recommended through the World Health Organization, but there are some from other uh, bodies too. And they can use different primers. So, um, and even when they do just one sample, they're not gonna use just one primer for a test and say if that one's positive, it's positive. So it's not exactly that clear cut. But, but what we're talking about here is at least one of the primers that they're using in one of the tests test for our, our own sequence, okay? So this could come up positive in any human regardless of the presence of any virus or anything else. So it adds another level of confusion and obfuscation to how do you interpret the results of a test like this. Now, I still think the most salient point is that we don't know where these sequences came from because there was never a purified um, particle of a virus where they had a bunch of them together in one sample, and they could characterize those and pull the, the RNA material right out of those uh, particles. They never did it that way. They only looked at it in this dirty sample, which was a, a mixture of many, many microorganisms and human cells. And they pulled these sequences out of there because they thought the sequences belonged to the family of coronaviruses. But that was based on only about 80% um, sequence identity between those samples. And, you know, when I looked and did that research previously with the other probes for a different protocol, for the Germany protocol, um, I found that many of those primers in that sequence had 80 to 85 percent sequence identity with stretches in the human genome as well. I just didn't find a complete match. Um, I've actually, I did find 18 in a row that matched, but those primers were 24 bases long. So, so there's a lot of overlap um, in this. And then if you also look at the nature of the PCR test itself, is that the enzymes that they use to copy um, the RNA make mistakes. And so they could um, give you a lot of false positives. And this is one of the problems that's always been known about this test. Um, and, it, and the more you amplify it, because you do this test in cycles, right? And each cycle, you double the copies of that piece of RNA that you're looking for. And the more times you double it, the more false signals that you get, because you're also amplifying like the noise signal, which is, could be other sequences that are partially matched, and they're not detectable until you amplify them so many times and then it's like everything that is an artifact in there is also detectable and that gives you a false positive. And that's one of the main reasons why Carrie Mullis did not recommend using this as a diagnostic test uh, because of all those false positives. But you know, in my opinion, since we don't know what the origin of this sequence is that they're testing is other than now we know one of them may come from our own sequences, like the human sequence, then there's really no way to calculate any accuracy. So I, I would say, you know, there's a 100% error rate with this test. 